Mr. Jim Allister has uh, been given leave to make a statement on the EU proposal to invoke Article 16, which fulfils the criteria set out in Standing Order 24. If other members wish to be called, they should do so by rising in their places and continuing to do so. All members called will have up to three minutes to speak on the subject, and I would remind members that they will not take points of order on this or any other matter until the item of business has finished. And I call Jim Allister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Anyone who thought that the EU was a benevolent organisation with Northern Ireland's best interests at heart and that the protocol was a manifestation of that had a wake-up call on Friday night, including those in this House who have demanded the rigorous implementation of the protocol. On a few hours on Friday evening, we saw the true heart of the organisation to which many in this House are slavish devotees, to think of it that the EU thought it appropriate that they would cut off exports, when it arose, of life-saving vaccines to the people of Northern Ireland. That was the proposal, and that was a telling insight into just what the protocol is all about and what type of organisation we are dealing with with the EU. For me, Mr Speaker, there are three points to take away from this episode. First, the callous self-interest of the EU, that they care nothing for the people of Northern Ireland, even in circumstances where they might need vaccines to save lives. It does not matter. The second takeaway point is that, after all, it turns out an Irish land border is possible. If and when it suits the EU, no problem, because that would have been the manifestation of the decision. A land border would have kept the vaccines out. And the third takeaway for me is that it does not take very much, obviously, to cause Article 16 to be invoked. So what's keeping you, Prime Minister Boris Johnson? Because a far more serious situation pertains than pertained that was allegedly justifying the EU action. The far more serious situation is that our trade has been strangled, our east-west relationships have been emasculated, our consumers are being starved of supplies which are necessary, a matter of laughter for the Alliance Party, but not a matter of laughter for those who suffer the belligerence of the EU through their protocol. So, and it will get worse, because by this time next year, under this very protocol, when the noose tightens, our medicines will be under the control of Brussels. That is what the protocol says. So if ever there's a wake-up call to recognise the malevolent and iniquitous in intent of the protocol. Members, time this is, up. is it. And there's an urgency now of unstitching it. And I trust to anyone Members, time the is union up. matters most, they will set about that through actions as Thank well you. as words. And I call Arlene Foster. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak to this matter of the day. A very important matter, of course, the actions of the European Union on Friday last, and it has caused significant dismay and distress, as the member who secured uh, this matter of the day has alluded to. And it was wrong, and it was unnecessary, and I think we all know that that is the case. But the first strike by the European Union of triggering Article 16 at the very first opportunity, without consultation, it would appear, without thought or consideration of the welfare of the people of Northern Ireland, has rightly been condemned by all. Firstly, it is important to be clear about what the European Union did. The export controls extended only to Great Britain due to the existence of uh, the protocol, and therefore there had to take uh, deliberate and particular action to trigger Article 16 in order to ensure that we, the people of Northern Ireland, would not be able to obtain any vaccines through that route. I think that's very striking and it's very horrific uh, in equal measure. But it's also important, uh, Mr Speaker, to highlight the nature of the action of the European Union. This was no accident. 
or some inadvertent mistake, as some have tried to allege. The EU had been working on this all of last week. It was done with purpose and it was done with intention. It was only due to the public furore that they changed their mind. However, even that U-turn, and I think members need to realise that, is heavily caveated. Their statement from the European Union makes clear that they hold in reserve invoking Article 16 and they intend to use it if they feel that they need to use it. That doesn't give any assurance or guarantee and that isn't completely unacceptable. So the first triggering of Article 16, by, not only by the EU, but deployed not to protect the people of Northern Ireland, but in an attempt to stop people across all communities here from getting life-saving vaccinations. Shame. We must also put this into context, Mr Speaker. The EU triggered, uh, triggered Article 16 before rightfully backtracking under significant pressure in order to protect an anticipatory problem with their supply lines. Article 16 allows uh, unilateral action by any party to the protocol to protect against serious harm caused by the provisions, which means that the United Kingdom can take action without agreement to uh, protect disruption on our supply lines and to protect the people of Northern Ireland. The protocol was imposed upon the people of Northern Ireland. I have always opposed it, and despite significant protestation and logical argument against its provision, it is still here. Too many people have been fooled by what it seemed on paper, but reality has bit, and unionists across the length and breadth of Northern Ireland are up. in anguish. And that may not matter to the people opposite me, but it should matter. It should matter that everyone in Northern Ireland are being denied supply of trade. And if they really care about all of the people of Northern Ireland, they will act. Thank you. And I call John O'Dowd. I think from the outset of this debate and other commentary, whether it's in the media or in halls up and down the country, people have to have calm heads. People have to reflect on the implications of their words in our society. Only recently we have seen uh, events in Washington where Mr Trump made a very passionate speech uh, to his supporters and marched them up to the top of the hill and left them there. And many in this society have faced the inside of courtrooms, police stations and jails because of loud voices from people who march them up to the top of the hill and then leave them there. So, no one's going to get more angrier than Jim Allister in this room. So let's not try to. Let's be calm, let's be measured, and let's look at exactly what's going on. The EU Commission was wrong. It was wrong, simply wrong. Whatever the motivations were, wherever, however they come to that decision, they were wrong in doing so. So, and how was it the decision, how was it ensured that that decision was not implemented? It was through diplomacy. Diplomacy brought it to the point where sense reigned in the EU Commission that they did not actually trigger Article 16. It wasn't angry words or foot stomping or uh, statements from this one or that one about what might happen within the loyalist community. It was diplomacy. So let's use diplomacy. If there are genuine concerns within the unionist community, we are prepared to listen to them. We are prepared to work with you and we are prepared to overcome those problems. Be very sure of that. But I have said this in this House before. When you drove Brexit through, did you listen to any concerns from the nationalist and Republican community? Did you listen to the concerns of the 56 per cent of people who voted against Brexit? Did you listen to the warnings you were given that the British government would sell you down the river? No, you did not. So let's learn from the mistakes of the past and don't repeat the mistakes in the future. The, the issues around the protocol can be resolved. No one is starving, as Mr Alistair claims. The economy has not been strangled as a result of the protocol. Those are all myths. They are mistruths. And they are provocative in their term. So let's calm ourselves. Let's work with each other. Let's work uh, with the Dublin and British Government. Let's work with the EU and ensure whatever outstanding issues there are around the protocol can be resolved. 
But I plea to you, calm your language. Stop saber rattling, and we will get through this. Thank you. And I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. What the European Commission did um, uh, on Friday was wrong. Uh, it was unjustified uh, and it was not acceptable. My party called it out, uh, as others did, uh, as did the Irish government, as indeed did the UK government. It was right to call it out and it was right that it was quickly corrected. It's concerning that it happened in the first place. It underlines the need for all of us to, um, to ensure that those who are implementing the protocol understand the sensitivity of the issues at stake, whether that's on an east-west or a north-south basis, and that they treat the treaty obligations with which they entered into with the seriousness that they deserve. Mr Speaker, I am trying today to keep my voice even and to treat this sensitive issue with sensitivity and uh, a degree of moderation. It is incumbent on all of us in this society to take our words seriously, and I say that to all of those in this chamber, because Brexit has happened. I didn't want Brexit. It is true that there are specific areas of east-west disruption. I will come on to those in a second. There will be a range of other areas of north-south disruption. Northern Ireland is not in the European Union anymore. We are in the single market for goods. There are a few specific areas where we align to, where we align to the EU single market, but to come on to those in practice, because some of the language and rhetoric that has been used around the protocol is not just irresponsible, it is inaccurate. The protocol relates one of the big areas of disruption in east-west trade has been around what is called and its technical sanitary and phytosanitary rules, Mr. Speaker, the movement of plant and animal products across the Irish Sea. No one ever anywhere has suggested a plausible way there could be a border in plant and animal health rules on the island of Ireland. There are farms which straddle both jurisdictions on this island. It is implausible. So we need to be honest with each other and we need to be honest with the people that we represent. And I see the member for North Antrim smiling at that, but we all have a responsibility. Those of us who think there's an alternative to making this protocol work and to making this place, this complicated place work, should explain what our alternative is. Now, when it comes to the protocol, there are specific issues where we need to work together and lobby the European Commission for easements, derogations, and processes to be made easier. We need to lobby the UK government to ensure that British businesses, GB businesses, I should say, are completely prepared for this change. We also need, uh, and I've heard the First Minister allude to some of this, and we want to work with her on it and, and all parties to look for some of the benefits that might accrue to this place. We have, for the first time, a potential competitive advantage in Northern Ireland. We have access to both the GB market and the EU single market for goods. Let's focus on that. Some of us in this chamber are sometimes told we're talking Northern Ireland down. I'm not. I want us to maximise our potential from wh where we go from here, and I want others to think very seriously about Number the language up. that they use. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, and I call Steve Egan. To do, Mr. Speaker, and may I commend indeed the mem member for North Antrim for bringing this matter of the day to us today. Um, and I will use calm and particularly moderate language, and bearing in mind that the numbers of time I have stood in this assembly and have raised the issue about us all working together to make sure there, there were appropriate derogations and this protocol, if it ever came into position, wouldn't be designed to damage the Northern Ireland economy, which quite frankly it is. I don't think there is any member in this assembly who is not aware of the impacts on our economy. There are very many areas that need to be derogated. Indeed, so much of it needs to be derogated one has to ask, as one normally does when you look at an international treaty, whether in fact it is rational, whether it is responsible and whether it is proportionate. It is quite clear that the Northern Ireland Protocol is not. It was designed specifically to deal with the North-South issue, but what it has created is very much an East-West issue. And because Northern Ireland is fully integrated, interconnected and interdependent with the rest of our nation, despite what some people may think, we are now in a situation that day in, day out, our economy, our society and our culture and virtually every aspect of Northern, life, Northern Ireland life is being impacted. We as the Ulster Unionist Party have said for a considerable period of time that the use of Article 16 should be there and it should be used. And if we look rationally, 
and calmly at Annex 7. We look at what should have happened, but in fact didn't happen. We now see there is an opportunity here, because if we do call Article 16, which I hope the Prime Minister does, we have a period of opportunity for reflection and discussion. But here is the significant issue. There is no Northern Ireland voice at the table. We can attend, we can sit as observers, but we are not treated as equals. We are not treated as equals with the British government, and we are not treated as equals with the Europeans. That has to change. And indeed, when the Vice President of the EU says we need to have a reset, or the EU Commission says we need to have a reset, we should be having a reset. And we should be calling Article 16, and we should be taking a considerable period of time and reflection to sort this out. But we, this Assembly, and the parties of the Northern Ireland Executive should have a seat at that table to be able to make those decisions. We cannot do that at the moment, because, quite frankly, the EU has shown that the best interests of Northern Ireland are not at their hearts, and I'm not overly sure that Boris Johnson has got the best interests of Northern Ireland either. Mr Speaker, we need to be at that table. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Stuart Dixon. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker let, let's be absolutely clear. There is and was no justification for the European Union invoking Article 16 or attempting to invoke it. The last thing that the EU, the United Kingdom and indeed the world needs is a vaccine war. So shame on the EU for what they attempted to do. But we need also to be clear, Mr Speaker, that there was no such thing as a good or sensible Brexit. However, we are where we are. Uh, those in this House who turned down and indeed opposed a range of moderate means to manage Brexit have failed to do so. They thought that their hard Brexit was the way forward, rejecting uh, such proposals as were made by uh, former Prime Minister Theresa May. It is critical of those to criticise, on the one hand, the EU, and at the same time, to continue to call on the GB government uh, to invoke Article 16. There are issues which need to be resolved, a wide range of issues which need to be resolved. My party is working on those. I challenge others around this chamber today to say what they've been doing to work to resolve the issues. That's what we're about. There are issues like bespoke solutions on SPS uh, checks, uh, parcels, pet passports, mutual recognition of qualifications, trade into and out of the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom, groupage, qualifying uh, goods, uh, frontier workers, shared prosperity funds, environmental issues, and employment law issues. There's a long list of issues which need to be resolved between uh, the United Kingdom and the EU to the benefit of Northern Ireland. We need to be working on those issues, not uh, shouting and screaming at each other across this chamber. And I do have to say to Mr Allister that I'm not aware of anyone in Northern Ireland who's been starved as a result of Brexit. I am, I am aware, however, of those who struggle to put food on the table. Shame on this House and the parties in this chamber that have contributed to that. Mr Speaker, it is important that we all calm, calmly address the issues that are in front of us today. Article 16 and the debacle that took place over the weekend has actually got an upside to it. It has opened a door for further and genuine discussion. It has allowed both the EU and, I have to say respectfully, the way in which the GB government have addressed this issue was addressed well over the weekend. But it has clearly achieved an opportunity for everybody in this chamber and for all the parties to get together and to address those issues. I call on the First Member Minister and the Executive to deal with these matters through their Brexit subcommittee. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And I call Andrew Muir. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, sadly, some of the contributions today have been entirely predictable. But let me be clear, the European Union Commission's decision to invoke Article 16 on Friday was wrong. Those who invoked it would do well to learn a lot more about Northern Ireland, ensure lessons are genuinely learnt, and perhaps take this week 
to read the Good Friday Agreement, plus the background to the establishment of the European Union. Vaccine nationalism certainly wasn't part of the vision set out by the founders of the European Union. To those in this House who now call for retaliatory action, simply put, two wrongs don't make a right, nor does ongoing inflammatory language and tactics help resolve problems. All these tactics do is a disservice to consumers and also to businesses. Alliance has been working hard ever since the Brexit referendum, standing up for Northern Ireland first and foremost, and seeking practical solutions to mitigate the impact of a hard Brexit. Unlike others, she just shrug their shoulders and refer to unicorn solutions such as Borders 2.0. The protocol is here, whether we like it or not, and is a duty upon everyone in this place not to lead people up the garden path towards some unattainable, magical utopia, but instead to work with and lobby both the UK and EU governments to find solutions to the issues being encountered. Throwing your hands up in the air and declaring it's all too complex and we should just walk away, as some in this House have done, is not the leadership that Northern Ireland needs. If anything positive has to come from the events on Friday, it is now perhaps that there will be a little more pragmatism and openness to consider greater flexibility when it comes to some of the most onerous aspects of the protocol. Alliance will continue to work to find solutions, not seek to create further problems. Lastly, we cannot allow a descent into protectionism and vaccine nationalism. Yes, we should and must protect our population, especially the most vulnerable, as soon as possible. We must not fail to learn the lessons from previous pandemics, where, for example, drugs were rolled out in the West to deal with the HIV and AIDS pandemic, but denied to so many in the developing world. We are one human race. We have a duty to support each other as we work to bring this pandemic to an end. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Nicole Jerry Carl. Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, the EU Commission were forced into a Boris Johnson style U turn at the weekend, uh, but we should be clear that they attempted to bark on a destructive path that could have uh, had serious repercussions for people across Ireland. This was primarily about protecting the interests of for profit vaccine companies, uh, the governments who mishandled the pandemic, and to cover, the, uh, cover up the EU handling of the vaccination programme in particular. It was a flagrant attempt at vaccine imperialism, uh, Mr Speaker, in which the citizens of one part of Europe were pitted against uh, others in an attempt to cover up the EU's failure to rapidly ensure its citizens were vaccinated. But it has also exposed the way in which governments uh, have adopted the mantra for many decades that the market knows best and the states cannot intervene in the economy, one of the mantras of the European Union, uh, the UK and, um, for the most part, this House. Uh, profits of private pharmaceutical companies have soared throughout this crisis, whilst they have benefited from extens extensive public research funds. Governments should not be beholden to the interests of for-profit private companies in the middle of a health pandemic, but the British state and the EU hands-off approach throughout this crisis has allowed their profits to stack up. At a time when governments across Europe Mr. Speaker, should be challenging control of patents to produce a people's vaccine, ensuring that as many people can avail of it as quickly as possible, they are engaging in vaccine, uh, in imperialism, in vaccine imperialism. The EU uh, have pre-purchased twice as much vaccines as they need. The British state has pre-purchased four times as much vaccines as they need. Unequal vaccine distribution is a massive issue, with uh, people uh, in poorer parts of the world being affected and likely not have a vaccine at all. Our health must come first, no matter how huge the profits are. Our health should not depend on what border we live in, and the people of Ireland cannot be caught in crossfire uh, that threatens our lives. Over 100 years ago, Mr uh, Speaker James Connolly said neither King nor Kaiser. Today it's neither London nor Brussels, but a socialist Ireland, Ireland, and we need to put people's health before profit. And with the centenary of partition this year, I think it's more relevant than ever. Thank you. Nicole Gary Middleton. Mr Speaker, our party leader has quite rightly described what the EU did on Friday evening as a re reckless and hostile act, a shameful and despicable action which should quite rightly be condemned right across our communities. And what was it over? It was over a vaccine. The safety of life. Shame on them. They told no one. They didn't tell the UK government. They didn't tell the Irish government. They didn't tell any of the parties around this chamber. Many of those, the, the Shinners, the SDLP and the Alliance, 
They didn't, they didn't tell you, the, the people that travelled across the world over this past uh, four years, putting the EU above their own country. That's what they think of the parties opposite. It is also, of course, a glimpse of how democratic, or undemocratic for that matter, the European Union really is. There's been a lot of talk in recent days of a reset of the UK-EU relationship. Of course, what is needed is the protocol needs to be dealt with once and for all. We warned of the way in which the EU were using Northern Ireland over this past four years to punish the wider United Kingdom. This has been proven right once again on Friday evening. To hear of Sinn Féin telling us all to be calm and the SDLP telling us all to watch our tone. My goodness. This is from the parties, along with the Alliance Party, who spent this past four years hyping up the border, hyping up the threat of IRA violence, to the detriment, to the detriment of the people that we all represent in this chamber, to the detriment of the United Kingdom, which we belong to. Rigorously implement the protocol. That was the cry from the three parties opposite. Do they now change their minds? Do they now accept that the protocol that they cl clung to and continue to cling to is causing serious, serious harm uh, to our country here in Northern Ireland? The mask of the European Union has slipped. They have said, however, once again, that they are prepared to take action if it suits their agenda. Now, what I say to the United Kingdom government, they need to step up. They need to listen uh, to all of the views of Northern Ireland, listen to what's been said on the ground from our communities. The SDLP leader on the radio this morning said that this was a mistake, that the person and the decision to invoke Article 16 was from somebody who didn't understand the protocol. I find that a disgraceful excuse. What I would urge the parties in this chamber today to stand up and be counted for the people that we represent. Listen to all the communities. Don't ride roughshod over uh, the unionist community. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Nicole. Sinead Annis. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the EU Commission was foolish. Friday's actions were very reckless and disproportionate. Ursula von der Leyen, President of the EU Commission, has struggled to get to grips with the vaccine issue in the EU bloc, and a bad couple of weeks for her and her team almost descended into chaos on Friday evening. But what we need to see now from all sides is cool heads and some leadership. That is what Sinn Féin is advocating for, and it is what we are doing. And I would appeal to others in this chamber to do likewise. Two wrongs do not make a right. And this notion being peddled by unionist politicos that we now enter into some tit-for-tat game with the EU is childish and absurd. Mr Speaker, let's inject some realism into this debate. We're in this situation because of the British government, because of the Tory government and because of the DUP who argued for, pushed for and voted for the hardest possible Brexit. The First Minister described the events as an act of aggression and an act of hostility, totally ignoring the fact that nothing came to pass on Friday evening. She is talking as if the EU followed through with their original intentions to trigger Article 16. Thankfully, they didn't. Due to quick dialogue and communication, the EU Commission realised that they were making a serious error and endured a very humiliating climb down. A climb down nonetheless happened, yet Arling and the DUP seemed determined to keep walking us into a political crisis. The political, economic and geographical reality is that it is simply inconceivable to put a hard border on the island of, of Ireland. Many fanciful proposals were floated and none of them based in any kind of reality. It's time to realise the truth. There is no going back to some pre-Brexit utopia. That world does not exist anymore because of the reasons I've outlined. The protocol is not anyone's preferred choice. Sinn Féin would, be, would prefer if it wasn't needed at all, if Brexit hadn't been foisted upon us, but it is the most workable solution for this island. So all parties should be working together to mitigate against the worst aspects of Brexit on behalf of all our citizens, instead of working themselves into a frenzy over a situation, Mr Speaker, that didn't actually happen. And members, the time is up. Point of Speaker, um, during his contribution, Mr Alistair referred to the tightening of the noose. As members be aware, in this chamber there was disgraceful graffiti in South Belfast referring to the same issue. 
in terms of a noose on the Tonister, Leo Vradker, 